nice to see uh, mostly new faces, actually, about 30 to 50 percent here. Thank you for coming to the Institute of World Politics. This is a graduate school of statecraft and national security affairs. And our curriculum focuses on teaching the full spectrum of ethical practice, of many instruments of national power at hand in our nation's arsenal. So, I just wanted to briefly introduce the speaker. Today's speaker is a good friend of ours at the Institute, Brandon. Brandon has spoken here on numerous occasions and has actually generated uh, quite a bit of attention, both on our social media accounts, which I encourage you to check out our YouTube page, Twitter, and uh, in addition to his own website and writing. So, today he's going to be speaking on, uh, like I was kind of tickled at the title here, I think it's a very interesting topic. Does Europe need nukes? And uh, just a very brief introduction of who Brandon is for those of you who have yet to meet him. He is a, uh, in addition to the numerous hats that he's worn in his past, he has served as a congressional staffer. He's a founder of a, um, an online report called the Weigert Report, World News, uh, a world news website. Uh, in which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he focuses on uh, an unconventional reading of many geopolitical issues of today. It's a fascinating website. I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, and I believe you just type in the Weikert Report on Google. That should pop up on the first page, if I remember. Uh, finally, he's a contributing editor at American Greatness. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor's of Political Science from DePaul. Uh, but more importantly, from our perspective, he is an alumnus of our statecraft and national security affairs program here at the Institute of World Politics. If you have any questions about his experience here, I would encourage you to come up and ask him in addition to the uh, very fascinating topic he's now going to discuss. Brandon, as always, it's, it's such a great pleasure to have you here and um, to your wife too. Thank you so much for, for coming you, out for and uh, to everyone else here. Without further ado, let's see the floor. Uh, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, we're going to just jump right in because of the time constraints here. Um, does Europe need nukes? Short answer is unfortunately yes. Um, we are not in Kansas anymore, so to say. The American, uh, the American led unipolar world, the unipolar moment, as Charles Krauthammer dubbed it, is unfortunately over. And it is time that everyone start picking up their end of the slack. Um, beginning, you could say beginning in the 70s when we first really started proliferating the computer chip, silicon-based computer chip, and when we started to uh, see the kind of major demographic shifts in the West, you could really start to say that's when the first instances of globalization began. But for the sake of this conversation, let's just keep it simple. At the end of the Cold War, the United States supported the free trade, open borders, um, you know, globalization, globalism that has defined post-Cold War politics, uh, that created a diffusion of wealth. And at the same time we were diffusing wealth, we were rightly insistent on maintaining our superpower status as the kind of the hegemon of the world in that post-Cold War era. Unfortunately, though, when you're diffusing wealth to the rest of the world, it creates the rise of the rest, to use a frankly tired term these days, uh, uh, but it's true. And so countries like China, countries like Germany, uh, a multiplicity of actors started becoming wealthy. Good for them and okay. But unfortunately, when it comes to keeping global order, that makes it infinitely more complex for any one actor to do that. And so that became a reinforcing cycle. And then on top of that, you had the rise, as we're witnessing today, the rise of the nationalist populist movements, which prize national interests above more ethereal global concerns. Uh, and then that reinforces the creation of the multipolar world, ending the unipolar moment. Therefore, it's time that we all start picking up the slack and doing, um, doing, doing more than we are, particularly in the case of Europe, which defers usually to American military might when it comes to dealing with military issues regarding the rise of Russia or Islamic extremism. This is not to say that Europe in general is not doing anything. It's just on the big question issues, they've not uh, been willing or politically been able to develop the full breadth of military capabilities that 
their GDP, which is $16 trillion combined in Europe, uh, could frankly afford to do. Uh, if you notice, Credit Suisse produced this wonderful, they mapped the poll strength of the world. Uh, this fe February it was released. You see that America is uh, the top billing five. These, this is, of course, a snapshot of current trends, as in what's going on right now. Um, and if you look at what's going on in the long term underlying trends, you realize that the world order is fundamentally shifting away from the pure American hegemony. Again, this is unfortunate, but it's a reality, and I go off of facts, and we should all too. Um, you look at the Europeans, the, you, you look at UK is four, the Euro area is four, and then the only other five on the map is the uh, small developed countries, the, CD, the SDCs, which is Luxembourg, Singapore, Switzerland, Hong Kong, Belgium, Ireland, Denmark, Iceland. With the exception of Singapore and Hong Kong, these are all European countries. They have the ability financially, they have technically the military capabilities on hand, their collection of the world's advanced democracies, uh, advanced economies, just leading the world in many ways. Um, and they've chosen not to fully develop those capabilities, and now that there's uh, still economic stagnation on the part of the United States, uh, our military capabilities are increasingly constrained, relying on us to be able to basically take on the world at this point in time I think is irresponsible from a European perspective, and more importantly from an American taxpayer perspective, I think it's completely ridiculous. We have plenty of other issues we need to be contending with in the here and now. Uh, Robert Kagan, he's a Eurosceptic like myself about the kind of that post-historical worldview that dominates the European Union. Uh, he said in the opening of his great book, The Return of History and the End of Dreams, the world has become normal again. The years immediately following the end of the Cold War offered a tantalizing glimpse of a new kind of international order, with nation states growing together or disappearing, ideological conflicts melting away, cultures intermingling, and increasingly free commerce and communications. The modern democratic world wanted to believe that the end of the Cold War did not just end one strategic and ideological conflict, but all strategic and ideological conflict. People and their leaders longed for a world transformed, but that was a mirage. The world has not been transformed. In most places, the nation state remains as strong as ever, and so too the nationalist ambitions, the passions, and the competition among nations that have shaped history. Who here among us today, after going through the last three years, going back to 2010 even, can say that this is not true? Of course this is true. And it's only going to keep going in this trend. America's overstretched right now militarily. I don't want to sound like Paul Kennedy, but I have to return to some of his theories because I think right now it's true. We have, yes, a $54 billion increase in defense spending, but our overall defense spending is, I think, larger than the next 10 countries combined. And yet, every day I turn around, I hear military leaders uh, lamenting the fact that we are no longer able to fully dominate the full spectrum battle space. I don't understand if we're spending 500 plus billion dollars Per year, where is that money going? What are we using it for? What are we not using it for? What do we really need? Right now, the U.S. Army has too few troops. The U.S. Navy has too few ships. U.S. Air Force has too few and old aircraft. Are I spoke to the former um, Secretary of the Air Force, who under Reagan, he came here about three years ago and spoke. And he was a nuclear physicist also by training, and he lamented, he said that he worried that almost two-thirds of our ICBMs in America may not even fire when launched because the plutonium cores have been allowed to wither. We haven't updated them. We've not been modernizing the force. Compare that to Russia. After the Obama administration's deal with Russia in 2010 or 2011, um, I think it was the New START deal. Basically, the Russians were given free reign to develop fully new intermediate range ballistic missiles, the, the tactical nuclear weapons that would be needed in any war against NATO countries in Europe, as well as to modernize their entire force. At the same time, we've been cutting our forces overall and not maintaining them. Uh, the US Marines have too old, they, they're using old equipment, they need to be replenished. Former Army Chief of Staff Ray Ordierno, when he retired, he gave a congressional testimony. I was working on the Hill back then, I remember it. And he said that it's, it, under sequestration, for instance, it's easy for us to cut capabilities. It's another thing to have to stand up those capabilities once they're gone. And it's going to take a very long time to get back to even what we were in 2010. Uh, levels. This is forced prioritization on the part of American, or at least it should, on the part of American strategists. We have a, a North Korean nuclear situation, rising China, we can't seem to figure out Afghanistan, uh, we've, we're dealing with ISIS in the Levant, we're trying to contain Iran, we should be trying to, I don't know if we'll be able to do it, but it's worth a try. Uh, we, we have to deal with an unstable Latin America now, which is in our backyard. 
And so all these things demand prioritization, frankly, over a uh, slowly resurgent, which I think is a temporary resurgence on the part of Russia in Europe. It's just, unfortunately, Europe has the capabilities and the means, they just don't have the will yet to fully develop their capabilities for uh, deterrence and defense indigenously. They need to start. In terms of uh, a strong military, well, as the Soviet Union proved at the end of their existence, if you don't have a strong economy, it doesn't matter how big and bad your military is, it won't last. Uh, America's economic growth is 2%, yes. Unfortunately, though, when you look at, into the numbers, you realize that that growth has been based on low, mostly low-wage jobs, temporary work in many cases, and if you look at the unemployment level, it's true, we're at 4.3% officially, which is a good economy technically, anything under 5%. However, what's, what's not reported rarely is the U6 number, which is the number of people who are looking for uh, work and can't find it and have given up, or the people who are underemployed. That's 8.6%. Um, we've our human capital in this country is withering on the vine, which means we have a weakening economy, which will translate to a weakening military, which means hello multipolarity, hello national interests of everyone coming to the forefront, and the Europeans had better start stepping up, and that includes developing nukes, because we cannot be expected to maintain this level of commitment. It's not that we don't want to, it's just that we can't. Um, that's not to say we can't reverse a trend, it just means that we, we're, as the here and now, it's going to take a lot for us to start reversing that trend. We lost our purchasing power parity. We were number one, economically speaking, uh, up until 2014. China displaced us. Next year, it's believed that in 2018, China will become the largest country GDP-wise. That's the first time in history since uh, the, at least a century that America is not number one. And I don't believe we'll be reversing that trend in the next few years. Uh, so unless, God forbid, we are directly attacked by Russia in the physical space, not the cyber dom excuse me, not the cyber domain, there will be no greater commitment from the US. In terms of American support, only 14% of registered voters in a Charles Koch industry and Center for National Interest uh, uh, public opinion poll in October 2016, only 14% said that US foreign policy actions since 01 have made America safer. 53% believe that, that both the US and the world are less safer today as a direct result of America's interventionist policy since 01. 75% at the time wanted the next American president, regardless of who won, to, to use less military force. 39% wanted the defense budget level to remain at the Obama era levels. Uh, as William Ruger said, he conducted the study, the United States needs a strong national defense to keep us safe, and the public is demanding a humbler, wiser approach steeped in realism when, it, when using our military abroad. This is gonna be kind of the sine qua non of uh, future foreign policy going forward, regardless of who's in office. It's just a question of capabilities. Uh, one of the interesting things was that YouGov did an interesting poll in uh, January of this year, and they found that only 46%, and this number is declining, only 46% of Americans um, still believe that NATO plays an important role in the defense of Western civilization. Um, so the president was not exactly wrong, despite catching foot pushback, when he said last year during the campaign that NATO is, quote, obsolete. It is making itself obsolete. Um, and again, that if I were European, I would be saying that means we should be developing parallel capabilities when the eventual time comes that NATO cannot be, unfortunately, relied upon. 30% um, 30, 30 of Americans no longer believe that America has a responsibility to protect Europe in the event of a Russian invasion. 55% 50, uh, of French share that opinion. 46% of Britons also believe this, and the Germans are split 39-38, though I suspect that number will become increasingly depressed. Um, going forward. And in terms of not just support, but translating into capabilities, Rand Corporation did a very interesting study last year, a war game scenario, with a, the, the current forces arrayed in the Baltic states, NATO forces led by the United States. Would the US-led alliance be able to stop a rapid Russian invasion of the most vulnerable states? And they found no, absolutely not. Um, the recommendation, and I thought this was a very politically correct recommendation, this was a, um, you tried to have your cake and eat it too, because they didn't want to admit the obvious. Uh, Rand said a force of about seven brigades, additional brigades to what we have operating, with a minimum of three being armored brigades, heavy infantry, would be enough to upset, coupled with copious air power and artillery, would be enough to prevent the rapid uh, overrun of Baltic states and the estimated cost of this new force would be $2.7 billion. 
the way these things work, it tends to, tends to be more expensive. And since the U.S. is right now spending, uh, accounts for 75% of the NATO budget, it's going to be on us, on top of all these other economic issues we're dealing with. Um, I think that seven brigades is not enough. And if you look at the Russian force that's arrayed against us, it's mostly heavy infantry, coupled with tactical nukes in the Kaliningrad, modern tactical nukes. I'm sorry, that I don't agree with the, with the strategy of putting a force of Americans and Europeans that we know will get overrun rapidly, at least according to the wargaming, uh, as a tripwire. That's just, that's not enough. The, the best result would be to get Europe to stand up its own, particularly in Eastern Europe. The Eastern Europeans are all about standing up. It's the Western Europeans and some of the Southern Europeans in NATO that tend to be a little bit slower to realize the threat. I think we should be focusing on building up the capabilities of those countries most directly threatened by uh, Russia and necessary going outside of NATO to not be hamstrung by some of the more intransigent uh, old world thinking uh, European states. Uh, we've deployed, by the way, one, only one of the seven recommended brigades, and that's on a temporary rotation, and only one of the aviation brigades. It's not enough, and we should not be responsible for deploying th these forces. And spending $3 billion on the European Deterrence Initiative to this year, not enough. This is, unfortunately, it's just a European problem. Um, we can sell them the equipment, we can give them the training, we should not be on the front lines. This is, we've got way too much going on right now. One of the things I thought was interesting, there have been for years concerns over NATO capabilities in terms of indigenous European support for NATO. And one of the things that we find is that um, James B. Steinberg, who's the dean of the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, he said in 2013, that Washington likes the partnership with Europe for political legitimacy, which is not a function of its military ca capacity. European political support allows the US to take a broader position in East Asia that is not simply bilateral. I can respect this position, and I know that many Washington policymakers think that, but that is not worth the price tag what we're paying. It's not worth the burden that we're bearing. And furthermore, um, Last time I checked, every time, especially the Germans and the French can, they, they try to undercut political legitimacy for the United States on the global stage. This has gone on for decades. So I'm sorry, it's not worth the price tag. And I think most Americans, if you look at those previous polls I cited, they're, they're going to agree with me. And the point of bringing up the public support in America is because in our system, the important thing is where the electorate is. And the electorate is simply not on the same page as those in D.C. who are saying, let her rip and keep going militarily into Europe as we're taking on Afghanistan and China and North Korea and trying to deal with destabilizing Latin America and all the other stuff. And so prioritization is needed. For decades, only, I think it was only Britain and France were the, and Poland, were the NATO, three NATO members that were consistently outside of the U.S. giving more than the, the basic requirement of 2% GDP and defense spending. It is a basic requirement of NATO membership that all members spend a minimum of 2% GDP on defense. The majority of the members were not doing this for years. Um, one DIA official uh, said recently that Europe risks collective military irrelevance. Frankly, we are not being good friends in America by continuing, continuing to um, subsidize this very bad, irresponsible behavior. The U.S. funds, like I said, more than 75% of the NATO budget. And Anders Rasmussen in 2011 said, he chided his fellow, he was the head of NATO at the time, he chided his fellow Europeans. He said, together European nations slash $45 billion, or the equivalent of German, uh, Germany's entire military budget, endangering the alliance's viability, its mission, and its relationship with the United States. Now, it's true that Europe has started to kind of maybe spend a bit more money, but it's still not enough. It's not enough for a believable deterrence against, say, a, r a rising Russia. Um, these are just a couple, just some of the strongest, most uh, important countries, I think, on the continent for building up a viable deterrence or European-wide defense. Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Poland, Sweden. Germany has 41.1 billion defense budget. Uh, per year. France is the largest on the continent, 55.7 billion, and they maintain 300 nuclear weapons. Italy's 27.9 billion, Spain's 14.9 billion. The thing about Sweden, although it's a paltry number, 5.8 billion, they have plans to increase the budget to 8 billion and to reintroduce their draft by 2020. And the thing about Sweden that's important and why I mention it is because it's their naval capability. Though it is antiquated, 
their naval capability in 2014, I don't know if any of you remember, but a Russian submarine was trawling the waters off of Sweden. And, the, and the, the Swedes got their navy together, and they hunted that sub, and they kicked it out of their territorial waters. They mean business when it comes to rolling back the Russian gains in the last few years. We should build upon that. The, these countries combined spend $155.1 billion on defense. The entire EU budget toward the collective European budget is $226 billion for 2016. These people are not hurting for money. They're not hurting for capabilities either because of their long-time relationship with us. They should start bringing something to the table here more than just, you know, kind words. Uh, the Russian, it's kind of funny because if you look at the, the Russia, all this talk about Russia, their defense budget this year is $49.3 billion compared to the large numbers I was just talking about from the European side. They say nothing of America's over $500 billion with the $54 billion increase that we just did. Um, this is, according to Jay's Defense Weekly, this is uh, Russia that suffered its draconian cuts to its defense budget by 7% because it was saddled with commercial debt and interest payments that it had to address. The Russian economy is tethered to the volatile price of oil. That has been, in a general way, kept depressed over the last few years, which has negated much of the ability of Russia to do this massive modernization. It's fair to say that the Russian military is the most modern it's been since the Cold War, end of the Cold War. That's not saying much, though. If you look at the, if you get really into the, um, the force level, which I'm about to, you see that their nuclear arsenal conventionally, yes, is very threatening. It's always been. And their tank force is the largest in the world. And while we talk a lot about the hybrid warfare capabilities, honestly, the U.S. and the, the European technical capabilities, I think, are still far superior, particularly in the cyber warfare domain. It's just that we choose not to develop or use them fully. I think we should start. And I think Europe should also start doing its end. Uh, last year, uh, Nicholas K. Uh, Vozdev wrote in the National Interest that assuming energy prices do not rise and there is no major breakthrough in either Syria or Ukraine that would end operations or see Western sanctions lifted, the Kremlin will have to start deciding whether to expand, re uh, expend resources on maintaining current operations or on further efforts at procurement and modernization. A major new contingency related to succession crises in Central Asia, for example, could also tax Russian capabilities. But at this point, Russia has not yet reached any moment of decision where it must end operation or forego further modernization of its force. That day is coming more rapidly than the Russian military planners realize. Um, again, the bulk of their tank force, which is kind of the direct conventional threat other than the nuclear force, uh, is uh, it's 15,000 tanks. But when you look at the force, the bulk of it is the T-72B3. The T-72B3 is a a glorified upgrade of the 1970s era Soviet tanks. So the, the inherent weaknesses in that armor remains. It, it needs a new gun design and new ammunition. The Russians blew their budget on building the new, I think it's the T-14 or Armada or Matya, which is a cool new tank, but there's no way they can produce enough of them to really be effective against a fully modern force like, like, of the kind that Europe could, could field or that if we had to, we could field in the, in the States. Um, and the designs that they're using, the 1970s era designs, are easily penetrated by Western armor, I mean by Western artillery and ammunition. And when those tank systems are penetrated by Western ammunition and artillery, they have this catastrophic explosion. The ammunition stores on the tank are not well, they, they're not well protected. Uh, the Russian military operates off of a good enough doctrine. They're good enough to maybe be able to defeat some of the former Soviet states. You throw in modern equipment, indigenous European equipment, you hand that off to the Poles, Ukrainians, and some of the Eastern Europeans who will hold their ground, who will fight. And I guarantee you the Russians are going to radically alter their uh, strategic objectives using military force to reacquire the old Soviet sphere. And as, as the national interest noted, Russian soldiers generally receive relatively mediocre training, and their equipment like that tank force is mostly aging. And given the, the, the fact that the Russian economy is both somewhat sanctioned and uh, contingent on the global price of oil, it's likely their modernization efforts will not be able to do that which Putin dreams of it doing. And this gets us back to multipolarity and, and nationalism. The president recently said, rightly so, I think, at the UN, we must reject threats to sovereignty from the Ukraine to the South China Sea. The nation state remains the best vehicle for elevating the human condition. The nation state, the Westphalian nation state model, 
is stronger now than ever. National interests, not global interests, will be governing world affairs. The, the rise of these poles suggests and the diffusion of wealth and power away from the, the unipolar center of the world, the U.S., and to multiple centers, means that we need to start engaging in more realism, engaging in more balancing, you know, balance of power agreements, and we need to start diffusing military capabilities to the indigenous personnel in Europe and not letting them basically keep deferring to the U.S. Um, yeah, I talked about this earlier. And to be fair, the de facto lead of, of, of Europe, uh, Germany, their leader, Angela Merkel, she recognized this in February of this year. She said that the EU will have to learn to take on more responsibility in the world. Europe is facing the biggest challenges for decades. It would be naive to always rely on others to solve the problems in our neighborhood. It's not just a response to what she sees as the uh, isolationism of Donald Trump, which he's not an isolationist, he's a realist like Kissinger. Um, they, the, the Germans and, and some of the more forward-thinking strategists in Europe are recognizing this diffusion of power, the rise of multipolarity. And of course the irony is that for the last 30 years, the Europeans have been the loudest proponents in the Western world of getting rid of the American hyperpuissance, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, I don't speak French, forgive me, uh, getting rid of the American hyperpower, the hegemony and diffusing power to multiple centers of power. And the Washington elite tend to have a fear, and I, I kind of understand it, they don't want to have a parallel nuclear armed European force. And I always say to them, with all due respect, the French and the British have had that for decades. The French have had the force to frap, which as I said is 300 nuclear weapons, uh, modern, and uh, they have their own metrics for deploying them in, in the event of an outbreak of a conflict. And they're, the French are extremely unilateral and they are somewhat hegemonic when it comes to their nuclear uh, force. And it's a symbol of French sovereignty, and furthermore, it was designed to this, theirs, and the UK uh, nuclear arsenal were designed to basically tether America to the European continent. I was at Oxford and uh, I met a re retired uh, Ministry of Defense nuclear deterrence policy expert, and he quipped to me, he said, well, the real reason we developed in, in Britain, and I think this is true of France, the independent nuclear arsenal was for the fact that we did not believe that Washington would trade Omaha for London in the event of a Soviet and now a Russian potential attack, which I don't think the Russians will do a nuclear attack on Britain. Um, so he wanted, he said that the, the European powers are trying to figure out ways to keep America engaged. The NATO axiom, uh, keep America in, the Germans down, and the Russians out. Today, the Americans are kind of in, the Russians are definitely coming in through trade, at the very least, and um, the Germans are, as I noted, the de facto leaders of Europe. Um, of course, though, so with the UK, and this is what should be a model for any indigenous European nuclear force, we have very close connections with the, the British nuclear force. In fact, if Scotland were to leave the UK, the logic the, among many of the Ministry of Defense thinkers, since most of their nukes are on subs, submarines, and they're mostly based in Scotland, the logic is, as a failsafe, they can always temporarily move those forces uh, into the sub pens that we have at Kings Bay in the American state of Georgia. And this is a seriously discussed topic, which I think is kind of cool, um, but that's something that shows you how co closely connected we could be if we push for Europe to develop its own, um, its own nuclear deterrent, independent of ours, as well as, I would argue, ABM, anti-ballistic missile, uh, nuclear missile defense shield, however rudimentary. These, those things are important. Um, the current leader of the ruling Law and Justice Party in Poland, Business Insider, described him as the most powerful man in Eastern Europe's biggest country. He met with Angela Merkel in, in February of this year, and he discussed with her funding jointly with Germany and Poland an independent nuclear force. And basically they wanted to use France's 300 nukes as a platform to build off of. I don't think the French would go along with that. It's infringing on their sovereignty. Um, but he's very much gung-ho, if you'll pardon the expression, about developing an indigenous European response. And I think that's great. I think it's fine. Uh, but I think if they do it in close coordination with the U.S., I think they're a fellow democracy in these countries. I think they're responsible actors. I think that we can trust that this isn't like proliferating to Saudi Arabia. This is proliferating to a fellow Western country. And the Poles need it, and the Eastern Europeans need it. Um, and there is a basis, however you know, haphazard it may be, there is a basis 
for European defense, and that's the Common Security and Defense Policy. There's 18 right now EU battle groups and about 1,500 troops at the uh, battalion level. Um, there's really only two that I can think of on the top of my head that are serious in terms of being believable as a deterrent. That's the Visegrad Battle Group, which consists of Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Slovakia. Um, and they're the ones most directly threatened by a potential Russian invasion. And they're also the ones who mostly have the capabilities to potentially be able to resist a Russian invasion. And also the Nordic Battle Group, which is uh, a Swedish-led group, which has a lot of problems. But again, if we can help hone in the Swedes to focus on naval deterrence, that could really be helpful in the long run. Toward the of the CSDP, finally Germany and France, the two biggest powers in Western Europe, and frankly the two biggest military, oh Germany, uh, France rather, the biggest military power on the continent, are, are funding along with the Italians and the Spanish uh, this new uh, fund by about 1.5 billion euros, which is 1.7 billion dollars a year, and it's to uh, acquire new nuclear, to acquire new new weapons for this proposed European military force. And they believe that uh, the national governments, adhering to nationalism, of course, national interests, the national governments of these countries will have control over these new systems and not some supranational entity in Brussels. Also, um, if enough of the EU countries buy into it, it'll produce uh, 5.5 billion a year in euros, which is about 6.5 billion dollars a year after 2020. Um, and uh, the Polish Prime Minister has made a series of comments demanding that Europe stand up its own force as well. I talked about the Visegrad Battle Group. The thing about the Visegrad Battle Group is it started as a mini parallel EU among these four countries, the V4. They have a combined GDP of 1.7 trillion. It started as an economic and political alliance and it's evolved into a military alliance. That is the best thing to do. And as of 2014, they've subordinated their policies to the larger EU defense policy. Um, if I were the United States, I would look to diffusing as much capabilities onto the, these chunk of actors and having them do the bulk of the heavy lifting on the ground uh, and kind of taking an offshore balancing role where we kind of step back and if things really get hairy, we can move in way to shore. But this whole thing about putting American forces on the front line as a tripwire, I think is, is I just, I'm sorry, I think it's unethical. Um, talked about the Nordic Battle Group. This gets back to Robert Kagan. The question is, if they have the money, if they have if they have the capabilities, at least on paper, if they have the know-how to develop things like a nuclear arsenal, why haven't they? Kagan wrote a book in 2003, A Paradise and Power, and he analyzed the divergent strategic cultures of Europe and America. Basically, he assessed that the U.S. was still mired in history. We lived in a um, Hobbesian world of anarchy, and we had the military to prove it, and the will, political will and economy to use it. Europe, on the other hand, lived in a Immanuel Kant uh, post-historical uh, haze of um, soft power, multilateralism, and he said that on the all-important question of power, the efficacy of power, the morality of power, the desirability of power, American and European perspectives are diverging. Americans are from Mars and Europeans are from Venus. Now that's a flippant comment and this is why this was a bestseller, uh, but he's not wrong to point out that there is a a cultural and political antipathy in the, on the part of Europe, particularly in, in Western Europe, to fully develop all of these incredible capabilities that they have at their disposal because of the experiences of the last century, the, the killing fields of the two world wars and being held hostage in the bipolar will they, won't they dance of the Soviet Union and um, the uh, United States. And yet, and yet, the calls for multipolarity continued for decades from Europe. And so we have the rise of the nationalist populist movements. We have the inherent diffusion of economic and now military and overall power to multiple centers of power in the, in the world. And normally, when you have those things occurring, it's fine to call for a multipolar world order, but part of calling for that means stepping up and taking up more responsibilities. The Europeans in general, I'm talking mostly about the Germans and the French, Though they were leading these calls, they never took up responsibility at a hard power level. And uh, Jacques Chirac was the loudest proponent of this EU-wide army that was really going to be French-led. And he said in the 90s, any community with one dominant power is always a dangerous one and provokes reactions. Clearly he never read Robert Gilpin's work on the hegemonic stability theory. 
He will rue the day, I believe, that he gets his wish because it's on the, it's on the way. Um, Germany, who with all due respect owes us everything after 1945, their former foreign minister, Ashka Fischer, said recently, the core concept of Europe after 1945 was and still is a rejection of the hegemonic ambitions of individual states. Germany and France share a common interest in not delivering ourselves into the hegemony of our mighty ally, the United States, with friends like these. Um, they're not talking about the Chinese. They're not talking about the Russians, who everybody's freaking out about right now. They're, ta they're not talking about Islamic extremism, in which Europe is more di disproportionately threatened physically by than we are right now. They're talking about us, and we're basically subsidizing their entire defense. 75% uh, of NATO, again, is funded by his Uncle Sam. Uh, and also China wants it. Of course the Chinese want it. And they've been budding up with France and Germany, building the One, Bel one Belt, One Road initiative. Uh, which is seeking to link the Eurasia, Eurasia together through trade on the land to um, remove the international trade on the ocean, because of course at sea the U.S. has unfettered dominance, and the continental powers of uh, Eurasia don't don't have the kind of reach naval, uh, in terms of naval terms that we do. Um, for his part, Vladimir Putin is not the first post Cold War Russian statesman to call for multipolarity. Uh, in fact, that was that honor belonged to the former prime minister under Boris Yeltsin, Yevgeny uh, Primakov. And Primakov was, he's, he's died in, I think, 04, 03. Yeah, Primakov was kind of the Russian Henry Kissinger. And he was the first to call for a multipolar world in order to balance against an American superpower, because God forbid the world be run by the United States, even though we diffuse so much of our wealth and power to these other countries. Um, he said, uh, Putin said recently, a multipolar world order is being confirmed. And in 2002, Putin applied the Primakov Doctrine, which is creating strategic triangles with other countries to balance against America's power, overwhelming power. Um, he did this in 2002 over the Iraq War, antipathy to the Iraq War. It was Russia, Germany, and France, if, if you can remember, who led the great resistance to uh, the American efforts there, and really undermined the transatlantic rupture, never really healed. And for his part, our former president also called for multipolarity. He said at the UN, no one nation can or should try to dominate another nation. No world order that elevates one nation or group of people over another will succeed. No balance of power among nations will hold. There's been a quiet consensus over many decades. America should not be doing the heavy lifting. This is bipartisan. This is multinational. And guess what? It's coming true. And so Europe needs to stand up. And they have the ability. They have the capabilities. They have the money. They just don't do it. My friend and colleague over at the Asia Times, David Goldman, he wrote, he's a financial analyst, and he wrote uh, from a financial perspective in June. He said the Federal Reserve is supposed to, or used to, set the pace for global monetary policy. As bond yields spiked in the industrial world, led by Frankfurt rather than Washington, commodity prices rose. That's because world demand at the margin no longer depends on the United States. World trade growth is weak in the industrial world and robust in Asia. China is the marginal buyer of oil and industrial metals. China was supposed to be the source of risk in the world economy. Instead, it is an anchor of strength. This is the first tightening cycle in which the impetus came not from the U.S. Federal Reserve, which presides over the world's main reserve currency, but from Europe. They're driving things. Uh, my, uh, Goldman also evoking Kissinger in 2011, he said, nothing maintains peace except hegemony and the balance of power. The balancing act always fails, though, as it did in Europe in 1914, and as it will in Central and South Asia precisely a century later. The result will be superating instability in the region uh, during the next two years and a slow but deadly drift toward great power animosity. Those who wanted an end to U.S. hegemony will get what they asked for, but they won't like it. And this was uh, the title of an article I recently wrote at my website, uh, Say Poland, Give Them Nukes. In fact, I would argue give Europe nukes. They've got to start standing up on their own. Um, and I basically, I talked about in this article, Ukraine inherited a lovely nuclear arsenal from the Soviets when they pulled out of Ukraine at the end of the Cold War. And Ukraine wanted to keep those nukes. And the Clinton administration at the time decided that, and I know why they did it, it makes sense at the time, they said, no, no, you, you need to, will basically Clinton informally promise that, and no one actually believed the Russians would ever come back online again. Um, Clinton basically gave an informal promise to the Ukrainians that, hey, look, if you give us these nukes, we will pledge America and NATO uh, informally to defend you in the unlikeliest event that Russia ever becomes a serious threat again. 
And the Ukrainians bought it. Europeans didn't believe it. And nobody in America either knew or believed that this would happen. And I can tell you right now, if the voters ever heard this deal, they would have said, heck no. We don't, we're not sending our kids to go fight in another European war. And this is especially true today after Iraq, after Afghanistan, potentially now dealing with North Korea. It's just it's not possible. And so what I, what I asked in my article was, does anyone seriously believe that Ukraine would be in the tenuous position it is in today had they kept the nuclear arsenal they inherited from the Soviets? If Clinton had, and I don't mean to engage in hindsight, but if Clinton had instead promised to modernize that force, to help regulate that force, that would have been a better solution, a more believable. Here's why. Um, I go off the Second Amendment in the U.S. You know, we have, in our Constitution, the Second Amendment allows for American citizens to own their own firearms. The logic is the best self-defense is the one is one that you do yourself. Don't have to wait for the police to show up because if there's a bad guy attacking you, you got to wait at least I think three minutes for a police response, which means God knows what can happen in that time. The same is true on the international relations stage, with especially with these countries being so close to such a massive hulking Russian force. Uh, I don't think the Russians really are serious right now about trying to go after more of Eastern Europe. You never know, though. And giving these countries nuclear weapons and anti-ballistic missile defenses and greater capabilities, um, it would allow them to have first dibs on self-defense. And frankly, the, if you look at Russian actions since the Georgian invasion in 08, they're going after low-hanging fruits. They're going after countries that are not technically members of NATO. They're going after countries and they're cleaving their salami strike, little bits here and there. Um, the low cost was why they did what they did in 08 and 14. If you increase that cost even by a little bit, the Russians will have to rethink. And um, so that's what I'm calling for. We're living in the rise of multipolarity, which means diffusion of wealth, diffusion of power, diffusion of responsibility and capabilities. And that's just the world we're living in, and we better embrace it. And I suggest opening the old 19th century uh, you know, books on diplomatic history, because that's the world we're in. It's not the post-Cold War anymore. We are back to history. It's the 19th century again. Great power politics. Um, this is my contact information. Um, the Weicker Report at gmail.com is my email. I, I do respond to emails. I'm inundated right now. I have a backlog and I'm getting to it. Uh, but please don't hesitate to send me. I will get, it, get back to you. Any questions or anything you need. Uh, at Brandon Weicker, that's W-E-I-C as in Charlie, H as in Hilo, E-R-T. That's my Twitter at The Weicker Report, The Weicker Report, Facebook. Um, my domain for the website is either the or just weikertreport.com, and I'm also, as Kevin noted earlier, a contributor editor, contributing editor at American Greatness. That's a m as in mother greatness.com. You can also follow the Weiker Report on YouTube. I got about looks like a little bit less than 20 minutes for Q and A, and so I kind of rushed through so we can have an interaction here. So I, I open the floor to preguntas. Yes, sir. Uh, one of my big worries about the United States capability is the national debt. Yeah. And I was very, I was favorably uh, reacted to the proposal of the, of the Bowles Simpson plan. Yes. But then I was very disappointed when Obama did absolutely nothing. He killed it. Right. Yeah. It seems to me that that is a major mistake and it's just gotten us farther and farther away where that could have begun yeah. to do some good. I'll never forget, I read, I actually met him before, Hank Paulson's book um, is one, I think it was called Dealing with China. And he's, one of the two books he's written recently, one was about the financial crisis in LA. And I, I just think the story is wild. He was meeting with the Chinese um, finance minister and the Chinese, during the, the dinner, there was a moment between the two of them and the minister leaned in and he said, just so you know, uh, Russia came to us because both Russia and China had uh, the bulk of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's debt they were holding. He said they wanted, and Russia wanted us to strategically time a dumping of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac holdings to further depress the American economy. Because the Russians understand the correlation between strong economics and strong military. As I noted, they live through what happens when they don't have a strong economy uh, in Russia. The Chinese politely at that time said no. But the Chinese foreign minister added something else to that comment. He leaned in and he said, Hank, he said, your country's national debt is your greatest national security threat. And this is true. And this is why I say we can no longer be on the hook 
for maintaining the old style of defending Europe. I don't want to see Europe overrun. I like Europe. I don't want to see the Russians in power, but I'm a realist. I have to look at the data. And the data right now, it's not that we can't reverse the trend. It's that it will take a long time. You know, Steve Bannon, love him or hate him, he said in that 60 Minutes interview that what Trump was trying to do in, form, in terms of reforming Washington was going to go many years beyond the Trump administration. That's if he can even get it done, given the pushback he's getting. So in terms of $20 trillion in debt, at least $4 trillion of that is from the endless wars we've been in since 2001. Um, piling on more debt the way we are, that's going to undermine our national security. And so what I say to the Europeans is, we will have your back. We will gladly sell you. We will be what FDR wanted us to be, the arsenal of democracy. We will give you training. But we are not going to deploy our young guys, and we're not going to be on the hook financially for propping you up anymore. You know, where I come from, I'm born a Midwesterner by birth. I was raised in the South. Where I come from, you, uh, your actions speak louder than your words. And as Rasmussen, the former head of NATO, was complaining, the German, not just the German, but the European actions collectively has been that they don't care about NATO and that it's really just, it's a big bureaucracy for them to play in. And I'm sorry, but we have real pressing problems in the U.S. Our economy is the basis of our strength. I, I elucidated earlier how our human capital, which no one ever talks about, our human capital is dwindling. It is not healthy. It is not sustainable. And how the fact that you couple that debt with the fact that we need comprehensive tax reform to stimulate 3% growth, which will be a huge help, and we're not going to get it anytime soon because of our political system being broken, um, that to me is the surest way to ensure that the US and the American people and the voters and the politicians remain engaged at the international level. If we don't start minding the store at home, there is no amount of uh, a war tourism that we'll be able to engage in. It's just not going to happen. And if we do engage in it, you're talking about, I mean, $20 trillion in debt. I, I, I mean, those numbers you can't even conceptualize. So I don't know, I don't know how long that's sustainable, especially if the economy keeps puttering along at 2%. And so if I were European, I would say, no, no, America, you, you need to focus on, on what's going on at home so that you can have, in the long run, uh, staying power here. Um, we'll, we'll take up the slack. But that isn't what's happening. Of course, in Eastern Europe, they're trying. And that's why I say, don't worry about NATO. And if the EU can stand up, great. But focus on the Weisrod battle group. Focus on these Eastern European countries, some of those Nordic countries that have a commitment to rolling back Russian aggression, standing up against it, and who also have the financial capabilities to fund that. And that could potentially receive, in a pretty quick time, um, the training required to man those systems. So, yes, sir. Um, one of the concerns about proliferation is, of course, the security yeah. of the nation. Can they keep the yeah. thing secure? Of course, you go to the back stand and say, well, that's right. Well, anyways, in Ukraine right now, talk a little bit about that, particularly the Eastern European nations, yeah. and then if Ukraine had kept theirs, could it have been secure? What's going on now? Well, I, if you look at what's going on, I guess it's kind of, uh, you know, chicken or the egg, because I, I fundamentally believe that if they had those nukes after the Soviets pulled out the Ukrainians, and had Clinton, instead of saying, you gotta pull them out, I would have said, no, no, we're gonna, we're gonna help you secure those, we'll create a, you know, whatever, a joint force or whatever, and we'll stabilize them, and we'll, we'll make them secure, and that way you have a believable deterrent. If you're so worried about a Russian attack, you'll have that. I think without that, that's why you're having this instability in Ukraine. And, um, and plus, going back to 05, Russia, we know FSB was trying to destabilize the country going back to 04 and 05. And the reason that Putin felt so safe doing that was because he knew there was no believable, no credible commitment on the part of the West, no serious capabilities on the part of the Ukrainians. It's not the Ukrainians' fault. Uh, no serious capabilities on their end to be able to really effectively hit back at the Russians for messing around in their, you know, in their country. In terms of the security issue, the government, though, still has general control, and that's because Europe is standing behind them. Um, in the Donbass, there's still fighting going on. So, yeah, Russia took Crimea. But let's face it, Crimea was historically a Russian territory. There was an overwhelming number of Russians living there. The Russians maintained Sevastopol, the naval base, for decades. It wasn't that hard for them to cleave that away. 
Eastern Europe, I mean, uh, Eastern Ukraine, you're seeing there's resistance. There's a resistance quotient there. And so, um, in terms of security, I think they could have, even under current conditions, they probably, especially if we're, we're, we're helping, the Europeans are helping, we could have stabilized it. And again, to your point, if Pakistan uh, and India can have nukes, um, and we don't worry about it. And by the way, I spoke. For, I, I come from a lot of a lot of members of my family are in the military. A lot of friends of mine back home. Back home, it was you either go to college or you go in the military. So I have a lot of I know a lot of people at the NCO level. Some of them are in special forces. And I remember when Benazir Bhutto, uh, when she was assassinated in 07, 08, um, there was all the talk about, well, are the Islamists going to take over Pakistan? Are they going to take over that nuke arsenal? And my buddy said, oh, don't worry, we have contingencies on the books for dealing with inserting forces to neutralize, because we have an idea where a lot of those nukes are, not all. Um, so there's ways you can mitigate even the threat of proliferation on a small level. I'm not saying unlimited proliferation. I'm saying limited to fellow democracies who are directly threatened. And again, even with all the turmoil, Ukraine is, I mean, political system is held. Uh, and we can help to, so we can, on a diplomatic level, we can do, we can do more. On an intelligence level, we can do more to shore that up. But what I'm talking about is the physical presence of most of the U.S. forces being deployed. Us paying for that, it's, it gets ridiculous. And so I do think that Ukraine, and particularly Poland, um, these other countries could conceivably secure much better than Pakistan, or even Saudi Arabia, which I think is on the brink. Um, but that's another other talk. So I don't know if that answers your hope. It does. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Brandon Craig Keller from Seattle. Um, speaking of uh, actions speak louder than words, uh, doesn't the way at least the Western European countries have handled the refugee crisis suggest that um, maybe there is no national sovereignty for actors to take action? I'm not talking about Poland. I'm not talking about right. Baltics. But um, and, uh, because there are differences, right? You, can, you know those better than I. Um, but this makes me wonder: can we even act at this point to I, I install so the nukes without yeah. the U.S. installations of those? Well, even if we installed them, I don't mind us. But we're not going to put guys on the ground to be the front line. It's all that's all I'm talking about. Now, in terms of the e, the Europeans, uh, Western Europeans, um, it's put up or shut up time. Yeah, and so I wish I could say I'm Mr. Crystal Ball and I can predict it. I can tell you right now, I think that subsidizing Western Europe for the profligacy that they have, ex they have exhibited for 30 years does not help. And I think it's time for some tough love. It's time to cut the umbilical cord, and they either, they either rise or fall. And I'm sorry, but if you look at the demographics of, of Western Europe in particular, it's working against... You know, we're talking. You hear, you hear analysts talking about the potential of Eurabia. You know, the rise of, a, of a, you know Walter. I can't remember his last name. Lacour or Lacquer, uh, the great French um, he's geostrategist, and he talks about this all the time. He's been on the forefront, and so I, I say, there's no guarantees in today's world. This is what makes the multipolar system such a problem: is that there's no guarantees. But we just can't. We can't keep doing what we've been doing. We. I. I am more in favor of throwing the dice and hoping the particularly Western Europeans can recognize there are things they need to start doing now. Um, and if you look even at the natural trends, I know Alternative for Deutschland, that uh, alternative right-wing party in Germany is a controversial party, I understand that, um, but they are, the reason they're attractive to many people in Germany is their hard line on immigration. And if you listen to what, if you look at the, the results of the recent elections in Germany, yes, Angela Merkel won, but the AFD got 13%, and they now have they have sway in the part in the boom, and they are they are on the ascendance. And Le Pen's movement in France, okay, yes, they they lost, and I don't know if they'll be able to because of the way the population in France has gone into the cities and taken up these knowledge-based jobs. But there is a fear in among the French political elite. If you talk to them offline, they will say Macron 2017, yes. But Le Pen or someone like her, or the uh, Mélenchon, the left-wing guy, or one of his parties, in 2022, because if you look at the demographics, and I think I think he, I think you're right, it would be the left far more than the right. But my, my my point that I'm making is, there are people rising that are populist, nationalists, and by the way, the far left and the far right in both Germany and France are very pro-Russian, very pro-Russian, 
And so national interests are dominating, proximity to Russia is dominating, um, and as an American I'm going, you know, if that's what they want, we don't have the capabilities right now to antagonize that situation. I think over time Russia's just going to implode. I, I, think, I think that there, there was too much working against them. And so Western Europe, put up or shut up, and if they might not be able to do it, and if that's the case, well, what we now know is they're not reliable as a strategic partner, and it's time for us to really move on. So, yes, sir. To trump on what, what you've said about France, um, especially when I saw the Berlin Dreams. Uh, yes, yes. Know, uh, Chirac refused to get engaged in Iraq. Yeah. He led the effort against the uh, war. Yes. Quite vocal. Uh, as well as uh, Sarkozy afterwards, yeah. the one who was uh, there to impose the no-fly zone on Berlin. Yeah. So we can see that it's, it's a matter of style. Yes. Style and, uh, and, and perception. And yeah. perception. <clears throat> Looking at uh, Trump's uh, general, UN General Assembly speech, right. uh, you know, that quote, uh, America first and new presidents, by the way, you also should put your uh, country's interest first. What do you think it, it is going to be? I, I saw also in parallel Emmanuel Macron's speech, mm -hmm. and he was talking about multilateralism, yeah. the version of multilateralism. Yeah. A few days after, or a few hours after that speech, he met with the Iranian leadership yeah. and now positioning themselves yeah. as, as an intermediary. That's what what France has historically been doing yes. as well. So what is what is your foresight or your opinion on what is going to evolve based on the personality of President Trump and the personality of Emmanuel Macron? Well, to be fair to Macron, every time I see the two of him and Trump together, they seem to be all buddy-buddy. Now, it could just be an act. I don't know. Um, but I think that in terms of, I think the greater question is, what, and I talked about this at one of my lectures here a couple times ago, um, what is the, the real question is, what is Macron's relationship with Merkel? What is Macron's relationship with Germany? Because right now, France has got the military power, but the economic power is not so great, and it's flipped in Germany. And so you're seeing this wedding of these two powers, and they're aligning nominally with Russia. And so the real question, and the real question is, what's the relationship between those two? Because that's going to have more immediate impacts. And it seems to me that, and this was one of the reasons why people were opposed to Macron, in France, it seems to me that there's a real fear that that Macron will be basically a crony of Merkel, and or rather a subordinate to Merkel, and that um, uh, the fear among the French was that he was going to start paying Germany back in, in returning its, its money that, that it owes Germany, and that that was going to impact the French entitlement systems. And of course, that is you know a no-go in, in many European uh, political systems. Um, and so that to me would be a more pressing because for Trump, um, style is always going to annoy the Europeans. But to be fair, whenever there's a Republican president, it doesn't matter who it is, the style annoys the Europeans. Hell, ex heck, excuse me, um, when Obama was in power, the Europeans were laughing at him behind their back. Clinton was being laughed at behind his back. The Europeans don't like, the Western Europeans, particularly the French, they don't like American power. This is why I included the game. They don't like power. Yes, they, yeah, going back, you're right, going back to Eisenhower. I mean, look, the French view us as rustics. Well, to them, we'll always be the colonials. Um, so, um, it's a good question. What, what, what is the relationship with Macron? I think Macron, at the end of the day, this is important about France, they're, they're vested in maintaining their independence, even within the larger multilateral structure, which is why, when I gave my lecture on the uh, growing German-French-Russian alliance, I said the wild card is France. The wild card is always France because yes, they want to do business and they want to get and they want to be that middleman, but they're also going to go where they feel safest, and that's still the United States. Germany is another question. I, I don't know. I don't know Germany, uh, especially if you know some of the other parties take over. I don't know. But Trump style certainly doesn't help per se, but it certainly does clarify, and it certainly does allow for everyone to know multipolarity is here. The Europeans asked for it, like my friend David Goldman wrote in his piece. The Europeans wanted it. It's here. So live with it. And American foreign policymakers need to now adjust to that reality. And by the way, that doesn't mean I think multipolarity is going to last forever. I think actually it's, it's like a, you know, it's like a, it ebbs and flows. And I think eventually many of these other countries will wear themselves out. And the balance of power will fade. And I think eventually America will be well suited in that case to return to its more preferred role of being a somewhat hegemon, of being a compelling actor, as opposed to a defending actor. 
So I, I hope that I, I know I kind of I didn't really directly get it, but it, it's a good question. I don't really know. Um, I think that I do think that France will maintain healthy relations with us, but I think you're right. They're going to go forward and try to be that middleman. And frankly, honestly, after the last 17 years in the Middle East, for instance, as I said before, if the Russians, if the French want it, they can have it. With all due respect. I have a snide remark on that question. Yeah. Okay. The snide remark is Macron seems to like older women. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Maybe that will yes. help with a relationship. Yes. 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 Uh, yeah, they, they do, but their big strength, they focus heavily on the, the submersibles on the, and, 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 you know, it makes sense, they, the Navy's always been the backbone of right. Britain. Um, no, and that's one of the reasons why, when I, I spoke to the, I can't remember his name, he was a former MOD official when I was at Oxford, and he, he, he was kind of jostling, you know, having fun with me, but he did say that, um, he said that really it was not a serious effort, it, the real effort was to ensure that if the Soviets ever invaded Europe, that Britain would have the ability to do a counter-strike nuclear, they wouldn't be able to do any follow-up strikes, and it would force the Americans to have to basically just go all in. Uh, otherwise, we'd look like, you know, it would be a complete falling apart of our defensive status on the continent. So. And uh, you had a question there. Yeah, pivoting slightly from the European geographical area, sure. going along your uh, theory of kind of letting the uh, indigenous powers take on their own yeah. security, own defense. How do you view um, programs like training the ANA, ANP, Iraqi forces, and, and, uh, and those are just two ones that I can think of off the top of my head. How do you view those? How do you think they worked? But also, at what point would you say, trying to say, we're going to train you, we're right. going to provide you equipment, but then you take it on. At what point do you say, Nope, done. But if you're asking about timelines, this is why I say focus on the Eastern Europeans, because yeah. they get it. Um, they want it. Um, in, in, in comparing or, you know, well, not necessarily um, training programs like that, because you right. said, hey, we'll, we'll show you, we'll tell right. you, here, right. and then go. Right. If it was in Europe, if it was in South America, because you had mentioned that as a, hey, we're in your backyard, this right. is, you know, unstable, unstable. Timelines, however, whatever metric you want to use, at what point where you're like, America, we're done, we need to get out of here? Um, I would say definitely once they get above 2% GDP spending on defense is when we need to start talking. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that, I mean, this would be at the, I would say, first of all, if you're, it would be not very well to compare what we can do in Europe in terms of training indigenous forces with what we try to do in Vietnam, what we try to do in Iraq. There, there are certain differences that just unfortunately, it's, it, you can't rely, there's just, there's a different world view that dominates in those other parts of the world that is so dissimilar from what, and again, the real threat, it's a huge hulking threat to the Eastern Europeans, and that tends to light a fire under people, and the Eastern Europeans do not want to return to Russian dominance. And so in terms of timelines, I, I don't know. Um, I think it would be shorter than anything we had with Afghanistan or Iraq, um, especially if Russia started making more moves. It's really contingent also on what the Russians start doing. And I think if the Russians notice that their targets are being armed up to the teeth, I think they might start making moves that would signal to the Europeans, the Americans are looking to get out. We got to do something to stand up because you know they're not going to do it. And I think that I think if Trump were to make, if he, part of the problem is Trump, and I know why he's doing this, and I understand it, and I don't want to throw the Europeans under the bus, but tough love requires you to be tough. And my problem is that at the same time Trump was consistent on the campaign and in his first few months in office about NATO needs to step up or you know, put up or shut up, he then starts undercutting himself saying that, well, you know, we're, we don't consider it to be obsolete. We don't, no, it may not be obsolete, but it is definitely in need of indigenous support beyond what it has. And so it would be, I think at the presidential level, it would behoove our defense policy people to come out and make explicit statements, I don't care if it's on Twitter, I don't care if it's on news, I don't care, that we're leaving, we're taking a step back because we have bigger fish to fry. And frankly, um, now I, I, I would say in terms of timelines, I couldn't give you that answer. And it's really good, but I do think that especially in Eastern Europe, they have a will. They have a will to do it, and they have the financial resources to provide for that. $1.7 trillion alone between the Visegrad countries. Um, nothing's guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. Um, but 
we, we need to try because if we're in a multipolar world and we're increasingly constrained and we're going the wrong direction on economic progress, eventually, and it's already hamstring our military in certain cases. A buddy of mine teaches at West Point. Um, I'm not going to say his name because I'm probably in trouble, but he sent me a, a, an interesting article recently about the Army's tactical readiness, the real tactical readiness that's not being talked about. It's quite frightful. And since the Army is the lead ground power right now, dealing with Europe, I, I, if I were European, I would say, yeah, um, I gotta stand up. And so that tends to really get things going. There's no guarantee though, but we're living in the multipolar world and there are no guarantees anymore. There's no mama, no papa, as they say in the military. So, you know, I wish I could give you a more, I just know that what we're doing is not gonna work. It's not sustainable. Brandon, one more, if someone else doesn't. Um, aside that, from the national will question, which we, I think we both agree that there seems to be lacking in the Western yes. Europe. What about, would you please comment on the technical capability mm -hmm. of mounting these you know, nu nuclear weapons? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I'm conflating even the American lack of ability right. for uh, uh, orbital rocket so yeah. engines supplied from the Russians, I, right? I know. So yeah, uh, yeah, maybe yeah. on these smaller I mean, theater yeah. type yeah. weapons, maybe we don't have the same right. thing. Does Europe have the capability technically to manufacture these? Does the U.S. have these? Is it? Yeah. Well, we we can certainly sell them the systems. We do have the capability because remember we're we're also moving away from the Russian rockets that are powering those those systems. Tell because, us what's happening there, if you don't mind. That. Uh, well, beginning of 2014, the NDAA it called that by either this year or 2018 we would no longer be purchasing those systems from the Russians. So. Um, and we were already starting to divest from those systems, the RD-180. Um, and now we're using the Atlas. I, mean, I don't actually know which one we're using now, but it's an American-based one. Um, and so we do, the reason I brought up the GDP, the reason I bring up the, 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 the mapping the pole strength, the, Europe's at four, UK's at four, the small developing countries are at five, we're at five, that's because we have a knowledge economy, we have the capability and the know-how and the money to really pile on and build up these systems rapidly. And so it's just a question of will, which is why I talked about Robert Kagan's work. Um, it's a question of political and strategic uh, cultural divergence. And the only way we're going to light a fire under them is to say, we can't do this much longer. And the American people, by the way, I really question if the Russians did ever, and I don't think they will because the Russians also don't have the capabilities that they claim to have, if the Russians really did do a physical invasion, I really don't think the American people would support honoring, you heard 30% of the American people do not think it's our responsibility any longer to defend Europe from a Russian attack. Can you blame them? Europe has got a $16 trillion combined economy. They have some of the best universities in the world. They, have some of the, they do technically have access to these amazing military capabilities. And if they were to just field those systems believably and invest in them reliably, the Russians would be deterred automatically because right now the Russian good enough doctrine, military doctrine, is, a, is arrayed against indigenous former Soviet militaries in the Eastern European side. If we started moving those systems into Eastern Europe and giving them to the Eastern Europeans, totally different story. Plus the Russians, the Russians know our metrics. They know what, what it will take and it's gonna be a lot to push us. They know the Western Europeans' metrics. It's gonna be a lot to push them into action. They saw 2008, they saw 2014. The Europeans didn't go rushing into battle. They went in and tried to negotiate. So they understand that the real problem is if we give these systems to the Eastern Europeans who have a history of being occupied by the Russians, who don't want a return of Russian, well, there's gonna be a complete sea change in the way that Putin is doing his strategic calculations. This, in my view, is a sustainable policy. This, in my view, is a healthier policy. It's a more equitable policy. It's the democratization of defense. Who doesn't want that? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I think, is this my, is this time? Okay, so that's my final question.